privilege to be at uh, Covenant Associated Reformed Presbyterian Church. Thank you for letting us come and thank you Eric for giving me the privilege to fill the pulpit. Um, so many good friends that Gwen and I have had here and continue to have and so wonderful to see your loving, glowing faces. Thank you for letting us be with you and thank you for letting us be your friends. Um, please turn with me in your Bible to the second chapter of the Gospel of John, John chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 11. This is the word of God. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This was the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word, and to add to it our reflections upon it. Verse one talks about the third day. On the third day there was a wedding. <clears throat> now to understand that, if you go back into the first chapter, you see at verse 29 that, uh, that John is writing about the ministry of, of uh, John the baptizer. Then in verse 35, it says the next day. Okay, so this is day one. The next day they see Jesus uh, walking by. John says, behold the Lamb of God. And two of his disciples, two of John's disciples go and follow Jesus. Verse 43, the next day, and here Jesus is calling, uh, uh, Philip is calling uh, Andrew, and he says to Andrew in, uh, in verse 45, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. And then they meet Nathanael, and in verse 49, he says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So that's the second day. You see in verse 45, I mean 43, it says the next day where Philip and Andrew and Nathaniel are all speaking. And they're saying, they're declaring Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament wrote about and predicted and promised. We get to the third day in chapter 2, 
and we're going to see the demonstration of the declaration. Chapter one shows us the declaration of, of Jesus as the Messiah, the promise, and chapter two begins to show us the demonstration of his power and the reality of the, the, the validity of those claims that he's the Messiah. We, we, did, we went to Oklahoma City and we did a wedding a couple of weeks ago. So I started, before I did that, I, I started reading some passages on marriage. And initially I thought, okay, this will be a, this will be a, this, maybe this will give me a, some, some uh, help in speaking to the wedding party. But you know, this passage doesn't really talk about marriage. It doesn't really talk about weddings. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating vignette. It's quite a little drama. Because almost everybody, almost nobody knows what happened. You know, in the world, there's three kinds of people. There's people who watch things happen Carefully, they watch things happening. And then secondly, there are people that make things happen. And thirdly, there are people who look around and say, what happened? We read in the first verse that, that, that this wedding is being held and, and the mother of Jesus is there. Now, I'm, I'm going to suggest that she's probably uh, in support of the wedding party. She's probably there. Uh, we, you know, there are people in the congregation that, that, are, that are, you can call on them to get a job done, to organize, and to make sure all the food is there and, and the publication is, is done. They, they're the people that make things happen, you know. You know. So she seems, she seems to be familiar with the wedding party and when she goes back and speaks to the servants, you're, you're kind of inclined to think that somehow she, she really is somehow part of the organization, part of the support to the family, to the wedding party. Um, then in the second verse, we see that Jesus has been invited with his disciples. So he seems to know this wedding party also those disciples, you see he has, going back into chapter one, you see now he has five disciples. So this is really prior to the beginning of his public ministry. This is kind of a, a, a scene of Jesus's family life before he begins his public ministry. Some have suggested that the arrival of Jesus and his five disciples pushed pushed the, uh, the menu beyond its ability to feed. Commentators love to play with this passage. There's all kinds of theories about why things are happening and the way things are happening. And it is very interesting to sort of play with it a little bit. Not to, not to uh, dis dis distort what's going on. But the setting is, is very interesting. And so because the the wine has run out in verse 2. They have no wine, Mary, Mary says in the third verse. She speaks to Jesus and says, they have no wine. Now that appears to be a request. It appears to be a leading statement as though she expects or wants or suggests or recommends, Jesus, you can do something here. You, you ought to do something to help these folks. But she doesn't really say that. And then Jesus seems to deny her. She seems to make a request and he seems to deny her. But then she goes back in the food preparation area and she speaks to the servants as though Jesus is gonna do something. So that kind of tells you that Mary really has a confidence, a persistent, unshaken sense that he will help. 
in her faith is not disappointed. I think there's a principle that we can apply to our own prayers here. When we pray, you know, when you pray to the Lord, you're never informing God of situations that he needs to be informed of. You do know that, right? You don't pray in order to tell God what he needs to know, right? So, so Jesus is not, I mean, he's a man, but he's not stupid like other men. He's not out of touch with the situation. He's very much in touch with the situation. He knows. To run out of wine in that culture, to run out of wine at a wedding celebration is a pretty serious issue. And I'm not sure, my studies were not that in depth, but the, the whole cultural stuff of having weddings is complicated and it seems that, that if you have a wedding party and you run out of wine, you're in trouble. So something needs to be done. Some people suggest, some commentators suggest that Jesus, that Mary is telling Jesus, you caused this problem with all your added guests. You, why don't you guys just leave and all the other guests will get the idea and they'll leave too. I, I, don't, I don't like that idea. I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's what's happening. I think Mary really wants Jesus to do something. Does she want him to do something because in all of these years growing up at home with her and her husband and her, her other children, has Jesus manifested supernatural powers in those childhood years? No. No, he doesn't because the, the 11th verse tells us this is the first of his signs. This is the first time Jesus has manifested supernatural uh, power. In, 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 at work, at his command. Mary didn't need supernatural manifestations at home. Mary received the words of the angel Gabriel when he was, was to be born. And Mary has indeed conceived, carried, and given birth to a child that had no human father. Mary's got enough background to understand who Jesus is. So she, she initiates, she says, they're out of wine. When you pray to the Lord, you're not telling him what to do either. You need to, you need to ask God for his will to be done and, and all will be well. Verse four uh, is, is is interesting because you're almost tempted to think that Jesus is rebuking Mary. He calls her woman, not mother. He says, woman, what, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. But I, I'm just going to say, in all, in, uh, this is not disrespect. He's not speaking in disrespect. He's not being harsh. He's not being severe. He's not being unkind. He really is being tender. But what is happening for Mary is Mary is going to have to learn the difference from calling Jesus her son and calling him her Lord. So Jesus is helping her. He's bringing her along to understand that there's a change going on here. There's a real transformation going on here because he's no longer a private person. He's no longer just her personal son, but he belongs to the greater purposes of the kingdom of God and to the people of God. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, you know Jesus very tenderly takes care of his mom. So this is, not, this is not detracting from that. This is not a departure from that. He really is working in her heart. But he says, what do I have to, what does this have to do with me? Or, or, or 
And that's a, that's a very curious statement. It occurs in at least four different places in the Old Testament. And it, it occurs where, where people are, are trying to get, they're, they're appealing to a leader or they're appealing to a superior official and they're asking them to do things and the, 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 the official objects. Why? Why are, you, why are you giving me direction? Why are you tasking me? Why are you calling upon me to do this? What does that have to do with me? We don't, we don't, we don't give orders to God. We don't, uh, we don't, we don't lead, we don't lead him along. He's, we're always his servant. We appeal to him humbly. We appeal to him boldly in faith. But he knows what needs to be done and his purposes are not always evident to us. When, when, when Jesus says, my hour is not yet come, he's, he's, he's demonstrating that he understands the long haul of his life and his sufferings and his death. And, and for him to manifest his power has to be part of that. It has to be serving that. It's not, a quick, it's not gonna be a quick accomplishment of all God's will by one miraculous, incredible activity. And see, we have something inside of us that wants a quick fix. We want God to work. We want God to do things. We want God to stop what we're hurting and, and fearing. We want God to just solve it. Why doesn't, he, why doesn't the sky open and, a, and great things happen and we get over this? But Jesus understands there's a great deal of suffering yet to come and we're going to build the kingdom and we're going to accomplish the will of God, but it's not going to be in one fell swoop. It's going to be a long slog. My hour has not come. I'm not going to be able to do this quickly and easily. It would, it would be wonderful if we could have triumph. It would be wonderful if we could just be, a, be home. Just let, it, just let it all be finished and done. Quick, just do it. But that's not the way God works. God puts you through lengthy, a lengthy time of life and journeying through a variety of things. He's, he's working. His power is unchallenged. He will do what needs to be done. But you're gonna to have to stay with him. You're gonna to have to walk with him. You're gonna to have to just keep patiently following along. Verse five. The mother goes back into the food prep area and says to the servants, the waiters, do whatever he says. Now that kinda, of, I think that helps to illuminate why Jesus said, what do I have to do with you? Imagine that Jesus just goes back in the food prep area and starts giving orders to the servants without Mary's uh, uh, preview, pre-preparation. Those servants are likely to look at him and say, who are you? You're not the boss of me. Well, that's what the phrase means, I think. It means you're not the boss of me. So Mary goes back in the food prep area and says to the waiters, if my son comes back here and tells you to do something, do whatever he says. That's a bottom line from this whole passage, I think. We can take that home. Whatever we understand from these verses, we need to understand that when we're reading God's word, it should, we should be led to do whatever the Lord is telling us to do. Reading the Bible is, not, is interesting, it's fascinating, it's exhilarating, but it's also instruction. Do whatever he says to do. Verse 6. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Now these are not, these are not plastic Tupperware 
garbage cans that, you, that are on wheels. These are stone jars. And 20 gallons of water, what is a gallon of water, eight pounds? So 20 times eight is 160 pounds. You know, you know those, are not just, those are not just finger bowls. Those are rather large. And there's 20 and 30 gallon possibilities. So with, with doing the math over that, you're, you're, they're going to hold 100 to 150 gallons of water. At, 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 this is obviously a venue. It's obviously a public town, a hall where people can hold special events like this. And when you when you have events, the ritually in the Jewish culture, you're to wash your hands and sometimes wash feet. So there's a there's water there for those purification rites. And then after the wedding or the, uh, the special event is over, then the people would also wash again. So it, it must be a, a hall that holds a lot of people. Now the wedding does, this wedding party doesn't have to be a huge, enormous group of people. We're not told how many people are in attendance. It doesn't matter. But, but I, I can't imagine a wedding party where they need 150 gallons of wine. There's going to be wine left over. And that's kind of indicative of who our God is. Our God is very generous, very generous, abundantly generous. It could be that there will be wine left over, and it's going to be good wine, and it's going to be uh, the leftovers with the bride and groom could sell that and have a wedding gift that will help them get a start, perhaps. I love playing with this passage. None of this is really at the root of the, not really at the center. But it's interesting to think about the situation. Verse 7. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Now, if the jars are out in the main hallway. That's going to create a lot of commotion. You know, they don't have hoses and pumps that is going to just bring the water for those jars. They're going to have to have a bucket brigade or they're going to have to have a, 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 some exertion of going to get water and bringing it in and dumping it in, into those stone jars. That's going to be a lot of movement. That's going to be a lot of commotion. I think that, pro my imagination, that happens back in the food prep area, not out in the main hall. Because the guests don't know where the wine came from. So the, they, they do, they fill up the jars. And then Jesus says in, in verse 8, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast, the master of ceremonies. I don't know if that means go back to the supply, go back to the well that you drew this water out of, or go to one of the stone jars and draw it out. We don't know that. I kind of, I kind of like the idea of him going, the servant going back with a pitcher to the place where they pumped the water out or drew the water out, the water that wasn't even in the stone jars, and goes to the master of ceremonies. I can imagine this, this. Uh, this waiter, whoever he or she is, that takes this picture to the master of ceremonies expecting, you know, just got to be wondering what's going to happen, and pours, he has a goblet, and the, the servant pours it into his goblet. Somewhere in there, the water was transformed into wine. Somewhere in there, it began to smell good. And the master of ceremonies calls the groom over. The groom has to know we're almost out of wine. He's got to be sweating bullets. And the master of ceremonies puts his arm around this groom and says, most people serve the good wine at the start of the wedding. And I see this groom just really breaking out in sweat because he doesn't know what's happened. 
but you've saved the best wine. You've saved the richest and the best wine for now. He's got to be mystified. He didn't know this. The master of ceremonies doesn't know it. The only people that really know, I mean, you can see that waiter or waitress after the master of ceremonies says, good, it's good, bring it on, runs back in the food prep area and says, okay, who slipped the wine in with the water? What happened here? So it's gonna, that's going to really create a curiosity among those people. Those people don't know. The majority of those people at that wedding have no idea that this miracle has occurred. You can't read the passage and say, okay, here's how you do it. God never gives you a formula for doing supernatural things. There is no, there is no procedure, there is no process here that you can learn from. It's a work of Jesus Christ. A supernatural work of Jesus himself. It's a miracle. John says this is a sign. This was the first of his signs. Now a sign is a pointer. A sign is an indicator. A sign is a revelation of truth that you didn't know about, but it's given to you oftentimes in symbolism or outward activities. What this passage demonstrates in a very real way is the whole process of revelation. See. Jesus does this sign in order to make himself understood. Jesus does this sign in order to bring certain persons into the, into the light, into the knowledge of who he is and what he can do. And, the, and of the largest part of that group is not afforded that revelation. If God gives you a love for his word, if God gives you understanding of his ways and his truth, if God gives you a right relationship with Jesus Christ, it is not because you discovered him. It's not because you were so good God took the initiative and came to you to, to, to do some kind of favor for you. God took the initiative and came to you before you ever knew him. That's always the way it is. You cannot discover God. Nobody is smart enough, nobody is honest enough, nobody is able to go and find God. God has to make himself known. And that's what he does here, marvelously, for a few of these people at this wedding. It impresses me that there's no ta-da, Jesus isn't a showman. Jesus isn't a publicity uh, 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 promotional expert. There's a humility about this. You know, the Bible always, I never cease to be amazed how God wrote his word, his Bible, with so much understatement. God doesn't, God doesn't just put ruffles and flourishes in order to call attention to frivolous whatever. God isn't prideful in boasting and arrogant. But if anybody ever had a right to boast, it would be the Lord. But he speaks humbly in understatements so that you can look at this and you can say, this is huge. This is big. This is divine. Signs point to higher things. Signs point beyond the ordinary to the supernatural. They point uh, to the divine attributes of Jesus. They inspire fear and awe. The sign indicates that Christ is God what, what we heard declared in the first chapter is clearly demonstrated in this second chapter that it's true. He is, the, he is the Messiah. He is our God. 
Signs give opportunity for you to grow in faith and to escape unbelief. Signs are works of power. And they manifest God's glory. They give you a ground to believe in the Lord. You don't need miracles. You don't need, you, you, you know, God, we, we throw that word miracle around in day-to-day -day conversation. Miracle, it's a miracle. And when we say that, when we say that in ordinary conversation, nobody then follows that remark by saying, here is God. This was an act of God. See, a miracle, a biblical miracle, always draws you to God. If he's revealing himself through that miracle, it always draws you to say, the Lord did that, and bless his holy name. He is wondrous. He is wondrous. A miracle exalts God and exalts the Savior. It isn't a, just a, it isn't just a anomaly. It isn't just an oddity. It isn't just random stuff in a secular world where there is no God. It is God coming into the world doing great deeds. I'm telling you, you don't need miracles. You need a, con uh, a concentration on the miracles that are described and preserved in the word of God. If you would meditate on those miracles, you'd know God. You'd know wonder. You'd know how to worship him. You'd know how to appreciate him better. You'd know how better to trust in him. You need to, you need to focus on the miracles that are described in the scriptures. Let those be your miracles. Let me offer a, a few concluding observations real quickly. Number one, nobody in these verses has a name. They're all described by their activities or their functions or their role in the little drama. Nobody has a name. All it, all it says is the mother of Jesus, the, the chief waiter, the, the, the servants. The only person, the single person that has a name in these verses is our Lord Jesus. So John is calling attention to what is critically important, and that is the Lord Jesus, who he is, and what is his great power. Every chapter of John will bring you something that you need to know about Jesus. So you need to know that Jesus is endless in power and he's generous. That's my, a second observation I'd like to make. I think Jesus is having fun here. I think he likes people. I think he likes to do good things for people. I think he liked this little bride and groom. I think they must have been poor. Jesus had a lot of interest in poor folks. And he, he just pours out this incredibly lavish amount of wine, really, really good wine for this couple. Because only he could do that. But he did it because he really cared. It didn't cause, he didn't do that because his mama was pestering him. He did it because he loved them. And that same Savior watches over us, cares about us, knows what we're going through, and he's generous, very, very generous. We talk about God being benevolent. Every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven. Thirdly, thirdly, 
<clears throat> I think we have a problem believing in Jesus. And the reason that we have that problem is because we don't think the wine has run out. We are prosperous. We have a modern world with lots of insurances and assurances. It's easy to believe that we are well protected and well taken care of. It's real easy to, to think I'm safe and secure. Lord, don't take me where the winds and the waves are raging. I don't want, I don't want to go where the wine has run out. I don't want to be in ser ser serious, significant need. I really, you know, be my God, but don't, don't be too strong in working on the details of my life. When the wine runs out, we're in trouble. And that's exactly where we need to meet Jesus and he wants to meet us. I don't think it's, I don't think, I don't mean to advocate that you need to go out and make trouble for yourself and, and, uh, and get yourself into predicaments. But I'm saying that we believe the Lord, we trust in the Lord when we need him. And that you don't need to hit the panic button. You need to believe that God's ways will not be interrupted and his purposes and his plans for you and your family and your church will not be aborted or thwarted. God's ways cannot be thwarted, the psalmist says. So when it's bad, it can be time to really see the Lord work. You trust in him. You believe in him because he did this sign. Our Father in heaven, we adore you and we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We really need to ponder and learn and enjoy and adore you more. Work in our hearts and work in our reading of the scriptures that we may grow in your grace and adore you and trust you and follow you more enthusiastically. Lord, you're doing so many different things in our lives. And we know, Lord, at times that we really feel vulnerable. Please build us up in Christ that our, our times of feeling weak will be times when you make us strong. Bless your holy name. It's in you we pray and for your sake we pray. Amen.